Hey guys, welcome to my channel, Realm of Ori. In this video, we will continue with Volume 13, Chapter 1 Unrest and Resolve, Part 2. And before we start, this video contains spoilers from the anime and manga series. And by the way guys, please don't forget to subscribe to my channel and click on the bell icon to get notifications for upcoming videos. So without further ado, let's get into the video. Well, you're starting to look like a king. That's good. You've been trying to meet them there since the beginning, haven't you? Of course. Considering the damage that would be done to the town, we could actually fight on the edge of our borders as well. In this way, however, the opponent may later claim that this is a legitimate defense against monster aggression. By being on our territory, it would prevent them from making such statements and would also create a sense of crisis in the West. Besides, the inhabitants have taken refuge without incident, and the enemy has penetrated so deeply into our country that we can be justified in going all out. Ha ha ha. It's good to know how to use what you have, but you'll lose points for saying it. Having said that, a king does not like to beat about the bush. The military, in particular, is prone to trouble if misunderstandings arise. So I'll be clear with you. The work of negotiating with the empire was left to the Jura Tempest Federation. After that, if you decide to go to war, we, the armed powers of Dwargon, will take part in the war as the Tempest allies. To avoid chaos in the chain of command during combat, we at Diva Heights will only be in charge of defense from beginning to end, no problem? Thank you. Having you say that makes me feel more confident. Come now. You knew from the beginning that it was going to go in that direction. In short, it was the most feasible tactic, and with the allies in crisis, it was enough in that name. If you have any problems, you don't have to come to me. We're backed up by a thousand years of undefeated Diva Heights. If the defeat is not such that there is nowhere to run, then this alone will give us peace of mind to fight. In that case, we will send the messenger according to the plan. In order to defend the center and the east, our country must divide our army in two ways. It is also more appropriate for our position to be thoroughly defensive. By the way, you guys be more careful. Regarding the new type of weapon you call a magic tank, its combat power is unknown. Looking at the Imperial Army equipment one would think that the era of using swords might be coming to an end. We are tantamount to putting a dangerous task on you, so forgive us. Gazel was probably worried about us and said this to me. Indeed, that is hardly reassuring. As Gazel said, the performance of the magic tank is unknown. So, while I don't think it's necessary, it's important to warn Gazel first. As far as I know, the world I used to live in also had weapons called tanks. It was to make the gunpowder explode, and by this force the shells were sent flying. The principle is simple, but the construction is complex. The power of the shell, the range, the accuracy of the hit, whatever it was, seemed to be impressive. As for the magic tank developed by the Empire, if its construction is similar to that of this type of military tank, it is likely to be impossible to deal with the current tactics. So the defensive barrier against magic will be useless? That's what it's all about. It's not just the defensive barrier, it's probably also the magic barrier. Not only that, but we have envisioned those things to be incredibly powerful, so to merge the use of earth wall generation, or tectonic strengthening, it is best to form a double or triple defense through trenches or earth walls. It's true. Is everyone thinking the same thing? In order to cope with the new era, we are also working on the development of magic armor. While getting jumped on by others, complaining isn't the way to go here. So what are our chances? Don't worry about winning, we have to win. That's all I can say. He 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 ha. You're a reliable guy. I wish you a successful start. Okay, I'll take care of it. Finally we finished this conversation and my call with Gazel ended. In terms of final confirmation, that was a pretty good result. Shouldn't that be enough to make sure? That's good enough. It means he has promised to let us go ahead and do it. The time had come. Now, we don't have to wait for the Empire to come out. We're ready for it too, so let's make this war official. We were on the side of justice. Within my monster territory, deep within the great forest of Jura, the footsteps of the Imperial Army's invasion have set foot here. This was already a fact that could not be denied. Next, we would be careful not to let the other party that we have seen through everything, and pretend that we are in a panic to formulate a countermeasure while dealing with them. So now it's about who to send over. Gobta and Gabal lacked a few things, and above all they were unfit to deal with people. Especially Gabal, thinking back to the moment I first met him, it felt unfit to send him as a messenger. And so, there was only one person left. I decided to send Testarossa. Well, if it was her, even if the Empire attacked indiscriminately, there was no need to worry that she would die. Even though it was all staged, 
It was time to negotiate a deal with the other party. Thinking about this, in order to give the key order, I launched the communication network. Gathered inside the gates of the Dwarven Kingdom were about 15,000 soldiers, the first legion led by Gobta, about 12,000, and the third legion led by Gabal, about 3,000. Instead of going inside the cave, they camped in the plaza at the outer edge. The Dwarven legions were also quick to prepare for the war. Yet Gobta and the rest didn't care. Not bothering with the busy dwarves, the members of the first and third legions rested individually. As for Gobta and Gabal, they were about to sit down nicely on the ground to eat. Sitting in those pristine white chairs were none other than Testarossa and Ultima. They were drinking tea. The man who served them looked like a butler, and this man was Veyron. This is so good. What lovely cuisine. I personally love it. Um, I am also content. The taste is fantastic. The more you chew it, the more flavor it has, the better it is. That said, Gobta and the others were eating a meal prepared by Zonda, an attendant of Ultima. It's a great blessing for us cooks to hear the two army chiefs say so. I'm particularly good at making palace cuisine, but not at cooking this kind of food for camping. Please forgive me if I'm rude. This is not to my liking. There are also very few items, I wish there was more variety. I agree. Either it is simply grilled or cooked into a fondue pot, which seems a bit lazy. It's been a long time since I've met Ms. Shuna and Mr. Yoshida. I hope you hone your craft more so that it will be more beneficial to me. Unlike the raving Gobta and Gabal, Testarossa and Ultima gave negative reviews. I apologize. Zonda immediately gave thanks. But Gabal said to Zonda, No, Mr. Zonda. I think Miss Ultima recognizes Mr. Zonda's handiwork, too. It's not really the taste that's the problem. Testarossa showed a look of interest. His words were denied and Ultima was displeased. Zonda was in a panic, afraid he would displease his master. Veyron looked bland and did not reveal his emotions. It was at this point that Gobta, who did not know how to read the atmosphere, asked a question. What does that mean? Good question, Mr. Gobta. It's actually nothing. Even I was often scolded by my sister. She wants me to look at things more in a female mood. So what exactly does that mean? That's what it means, Mr. Gobta. If it's this, we can dine like this without looking at the others. But Miss Testarossa and Miss Ultima can't be like us, can they? Hearing this side, Zonda understood the meaning of Gabble's words and at the same time dawned on him. Oh, it's not like Mr. Gabble to have such a great opinion. Thank you, I've been working on it too. That being said, this is actually sold from Lord Rimuru's side. Speaking of this side, Gabble began to talk about what had happened not long ago when he went to consult with Rimuru. I also want to be as popular with women as Lord Rimuru, what should I do? Asking me something like that? I'm also, no, nothing. Gabble, let me teach you a trick or two. If you want to be popular with women, you have to know how to compare your heart to her heart. In this way, I think the other person will naturally feel good about it. Gabble proudly said he once had such a conversation with Rimuru. Then I remembered what that Soka said. What Lord Rimuru was trying to say was, don't do things that would make the other person hate you. That's when I realized that it turned out to be so basic. Listening to Gabble's headline, everyone felt a sense of admiration. They thought to themselves, you're worthy of the name Rimuru. I'm sorry, Lady Ultima, and Lady Testarossa. We'll definitely work harder next time and serve the dishes you expect. Oh, what a good servant you have. By comparison, my servants are. What are you talking about? As far as I'm concerned, Moss seems pretty handy too. And Sian, being able to hand over the job of agent means he's good at paperwork, right? The servants under me are better at physical labor, and I envy having servants who can take care of those chores. That's true, perhaps you are right. It's futile to ask for something that you don't have. It's always a problem for girls. That's what it means, simply to be able to cut it into bite-sized pieces and serve it better when you serve it. And I understand what Mr. Gabble is saying, but seriously, that's a pain in the ass. Mr. Gobta, even if you have that thought, you can't say it. This is the first step to becoming a gentleman. I learned this from Lord Rimuru's words. Geez, I know that. But this is a battlefield. Eat when you can, and don't be too extravagant about it. That's the right attitude to have at a time like this, and that's what I thought when I was in charge by being the army chief. What fun Gobta boy. I'm starting to get excited. Yes, indeed. Fortunately, he was the one responsible for corresponding with me. Testarossa and Ultima responded with a smile. Ah, this is bad, everyone but Gobta thought so. Gobchi knew that Gobta meant no harm, he was just being frank about his feelings, and it was because the two had known each other for a long time and knew that Gobta was not wrong in what he said. But in this world, life on earth could not be about right and wrong. 
These correct statements didn't work for some people. Gobta Kun, it's not good to preach to such people. That's the state of mind that Gobchi was currently in. He had guessed correctly that Gobta was in a very dangerous position at the moment. Testarossa and Ultima were not angry with Gobta at all, simply treating him as a fun toy. But they were still demon primordials, and being treated as toys by them meant that. The fate of Gobta was like a candle in the wind. But just at this time, a miracle happened. 